thank you very much for the invitation. And also, I think I speak on behalf of all the new fellows. It really is overwhelming to be, to be part of this uh, ceremony and to, to receive the, these, this, this membership. So thank you very much. Um, as you will have gathered from the... Uh, I, I'm rather daunted by this talk because not only have we got all these eminent um, people in the room, we've also got people who are not involved directly in research. And so it's quite difficult. And so I'm sure that I will um, not only uh, insult some people by telling them things that are absolutely obvious, but also go over the top of other people's heads by telling them things that, that really aren't obvious at all. So I, I've really tried my best to do something sensible. Um, and what I uh, thought it would be good to talk about was really uh, exploring human variation and its impact on proteins, which is my, my first love, the, the structure of proteins, and in the clinic. Now, how do I make this work? Hang on. There we go. So it's quite remarkable, the, pro the progress over the last, really, 10 years. If we think um, Darwin's theory of evolution about 1850, and then the discovery of the structure of DNA in 1953, and then with the Sanger uh, sequencing method to allow us to sequence DNA, and the first human composite genome was only, only determined, the sequence of that was only determined in 2000. And already by 2007, we had genomes for individuals, not just a general one, but for individual people. Hang on. Oh, sorry, it takes a bit of time. Um, for those, just to bring everybody hopefully on the same page, this is what the human genome looks like, and that we each, each of us have a set of DNA bases. Uh, in total, we have 3,000 million letters of DNA code each, huge number. And these code for about, only about 21,000 genes. And that was the first surprise, that there were so few genes, and each of these genes codes for a protein that's made up, it's a long molecule made up of amino acids that folds up into a compact globular structure. And that structure is what gives the protein its function. Now, the other thing that's happened really now is the change in the cost of sequencing a genome. So the first sequence took $10 billion and 10 years to determine. And in fact, it cost about the cost of the most expensive house in London. Now, the cost of sequencing a genome is the cost of a family season ticket at Arsenal. So, <laughs> you know, this is a huge change. And it means that this really opens up new doors because we can sequence individuals, really, and we will sequence individuals. And when I joined EBI in 2001, the first challenge I was given was to talk about the $1,000 genome. And now, 13 years later, we're there at the $1,000 genome. That's what it costs. And so that means that we're going to be able to sequence each and every one of us. And so in one person, and uh, there will be this sequence. So most of us, for 99. 9% of our genomes, we're all identical. We've all got the same sequence of letters. But occasionally, we have variants. And in this case, the G is replaced by an A. And it's those variants that between us that make us different from each other. And really, these genes then code for the proteins. And this variation at the DNA level gives changes in the protein produced and that gives changes in the function, functional capability of that protein. Now, we all know that these variants can be serious, and this just shows a very high-profile example where uh, variants in BRCA A1 gene uh, lead to breast cancer, almost certainly lead to breast cancer. And we know that, there, therefore, people who have this in their genome, who, who inherit it from their parents, 
um, have the choice about whether or not to have mastectomy. So this is a serious, this is a very clear-cut example where variants lead to disease. But there are many other examples like this, and most, frankly, we have no idea about yet. So we are just beginning, beginning to understand this relationship between change in sequence and change in function and disease. And so we can begin to think about interpreting human variation. And the first project, really, that attempted this was the Thousand Genomes, where there was a, um, a project funded uh, by a variety of, of funding bodies to sequence a the sequences, the genome sequences of a thousand different people. And that allows us to ask new questions. It allows us to ask, how do we differ for, from one another? How does this molecular difference translate into the physical difference, the emotional differences, all those that we see? What causes are different susceptibilities to diseases. Do, the, do this genome dip variations contribute to these differences? We can, and the only way that we can really look at this is by comparing an individual genome against reference genomes. It's all in comparison. You look at your own genome and see how it differs from other people's, and then you look at how different you are from other people. So it's all to do with comparison. It's all to do, actually, with handling data. And we can combine that information about the genomes with other types of data, critically clinical data, and that will provide insight into human variation. And as I said, this is largely a data-driven process. Ultimately, the interpretation comes down to looking at this, these, this information and processing the data that's involved with it. And so we have, this is not easy, so we have, I told you, we have three billion bases in our DNA. Each of us have about four million variants between, between ourselves and, and the standard. So that's a lot of variants to think about. Many of them aren't in coding regions, many of them don't produce proteins, but they often produce variation in the regulation, and so that's equally, if not more, complex, actually. We have 21,000 coding variants, and in total we have about 10,000 non-synonymous variants. That means that it changes the amino acid in the protein. So you get a change in the amino So each of us have about 10,000 changes to our, our DNA, and that leads to 10,000 changes to our proteins. And of those, most of them, frankly, don't make any difference. That's why we're all relatively normal. But there are just a few variants that really are, cause changes in protein functions. And those 50 to 100 cause some change, not necessarily loss, sometimes it's gain of function. And so the question is, what... Now we are in a unique position because we have, for the first time, data for individuals. And we can look at variations, and we can look at the variations which change amino acids in proteins. And this, because my background is in protein structure, we know that the gene sequence determines the protein amino acid sequence, which determines the structure of this, the 3D structure, and its function. And it is clear that this, a change in one amino acid in a protein can cause the protein to malfunction. And so um, what we did was to look at this, these thousand genomes, and many other people have done this too, and asked, well, these thousand genomes, these are for, from people who are healthy individuals. They, don't, they might develop diseases later on, but at the moment they're healthy individuals. And we wanted to look at the number of changes between one amino acid and another. So we ended up with 106,000 of these variants, amino acid changes. And you can plot a very nice matrix that tells you every time one amino acid gets exchanged for another. And when you do this, you can plot things like, uh, if you look at the frequency of occurrence of the different amino acids, which are represented by these spots here, 
and you find that in general the number of variants or mutations increases linearly. But there are exceptions. Our genome is, is changed about 10 times more often than any other amino acid, and leucine is changed much less, less frequently. This has been well known, but it comes out loud and clear from looking at these variants. But you can also compare these variants, these what I'll call natural variants, with disease-associated disease variants. The variants that are known to be associated with some disease and say, well, is there a difference between those, those variants that cause diseases and those variants that have no impact? And so to do that, we compared them with something called OMIM, which is a database as I said, it all comes down to looking at data, uh, a database of individual variants that are inherited, OMIM, online uh, Mendelian inheritance in man. So these mutations are actually passed from parent to child. That means that they're not usually lethal. They don't kill people off because they live long enough to produce children. So they are special sort of variants. And we can ask how these variants compare with the natural variants that we see in the 1,000 genomes. And what we see straight away is that there's a big difference between the two. So I can't, the people who aren't familiar with proteins, this is, this is a bit complicated, but what I've, what I've done is to rank order the 20 amino acids with arginine, the R stands for arginine, is the residue, the amino acid, which is, uh, which is the most common variant in the 1,000 gen genomes variants. When we look at it in the disease-associated variants, it's only the fourth most common. If we look at tryptophan, this W at the bottom, that's the one that's hardly ever changed in natural variants. In fact, in diseases, this is the most common variant that causes disease in OMIP. So there's a radical difference between the, th the, the natural variants and the disease-associated variants. So that's an important point. Now, this is pretty basic stuff, but it shows the level of what we're just beginning to learn about by having this variation data. We can also see, uh, and this again shows a plot, which shows that disease-associated variants occur in the most conserved residues in proteins. So this just compares the thousand, this is, conservation. So over evolutionary time, some amino acids, some positions are very, very well conserved. Other positions vary all the time and it doesn't matter. So what you find for the natural variants is that they are biased somewhat towards those positions that don't matter. So you get these variants in positions that don't matter. But when you look at the disease associated variants in the thousand genomes, you find that they occur in those positions which are the most important, the most conserved in proteins. And also, when you then, you can build models, so you, this shows one particular protein in which there are about 40-odd variants that cause um, a, a given disease. When you build models of all these 106,000 variants, what you see is that disease-associated variants are more likely to be buried right in the middle of the protein, but they're less likely to be functional than the natural ones. And that was a surprise for us, because we thought they'd be more likely to be functional. But in fact, because these are OMIM, these are inherited mutations, they don't hit those critical residues that are vital for function. They modulate the function. They change the function in such a way so they don't destroy it. If they destroyed it, the person would probably be dead. So they just modulate the function to change it in this, this way. So this is really just a little taste of the sort of things that you can do now that we're getting variation data and research. There's an infinity more of things that need to be looked at in this respect. But actually, what you want to do is really now to associate these variants with diseases. And that means that as well as having the, the genome data, you need all the clinical, what's called phenotype data. 
I, something like whether you're tall or short or whether you've got blue eyes or brown eyes, those are all phenotypes. So you need all of this data. And really what you want to be able to do is to interpret these variations that we see in the genomes and relate them to disease processes. Now, that's a very simple thing to say, but my goodness me, it's going to be the next 50 years that we're going to spend trying to do this because we don't understand all of the biological processes, we don't understand the diseases, and we certainly don't understand how these variations uh, uh, lead to diseases in many cases. And so um, at EBI, uh, one of our projects is Ensemble, and this is used to interpret genome variation by comparison. And what you need to do when you're trying to do this at scale is to import, collect, integrate, and annotate all known variants. This is the basis that everybody needs in order to interpret variants so that when new variants are seen, you can compare it with what's already known. You need tools for comparison, and you need to provide a framework to improve the understanding and reporting. So this is all part of the ensemble data resource that is at, a, at, uh, at EBI. And here you can see for that BRCA1, this is just sort of emphasizes the scale of the problem. Here we see for that BRCA1 gene, for one part of it, these little spots, I don't know if you can see all the little spots here, each one of those represents a different variant. And so you can see that people have a huge, there are a huge number of variants, and trying to understand, some of these don't have any effect. They don't call, cause uh, diseases. Others, of course, are really bad and always lead to more or less to breast cancer. And so trying to, <laughs> trying to sort out the, the wolf from the sheep amongst these is really one of the big challenges. And so um, one of the great things that's happened in the UK over the last uh, year, I guess it is now, is that uh, it's been decided to sequence the genomes of 100,000 patients. So this is a very ambitious project. It's more than all the sequencing that's been done so far. It's an enormous amount of sequencing. And there were various challenges. So a, a company, uh, Genomics England, and some people in the audience are involved with this, um, they ha have to there has to, had to be a decision which has involved many stakeholders about which genomes, how we interpret the data, and what are the ethics uh, associated with all of this. Um, but I have to say, this is the most ambitious project in the world for this. It's directly related to the clinical pathways, which makes it very exciting, because it's all, already integrated into the, the, um, the, the medical and the NHS. And so the areas of research that they've decided to look at are essentially germline, risk to disease. This, these are the rare diseases. And here you see a child who has a rare disease. It's a mutation a do, um, that has occurred probably spontaneously that has led to a certain disease. Some of these are inherited. And one of the challenges when children present with diseases is, um, and often they're developmental diseases, is to understand what's the cause, because until you know the cause, you sure as hell can't work out a solution and a, and a treatment. And so using the genomes to try to understand the, the origin of some of these rare diseases is going to be critical. The other, of course, is in precision cancer, and we heard several of, our, uh, of the new fellows were involved in precision cancer and the idea that using the, the genome of the cancer, because of course in cancer, the genome is changed. This is the problem with cancer. It's multiple changes that build on each other. And so each cancer is different. Each cancer requires a different treatment. And so using the sequencing to identify the, the basis for each cancer, and so to be able to allocate the right treatment for that is going to be critical. And the other very important area is in pathogens and hospital-acquired infections. And this actually isn't sequencing usually of the human, 
its sequencing of the pathogen to know what is the problem. Now, many people have been to the doctors and you say, and he just says, oh, you've got a bacterial infection, and he gives you an antibiotic, and it doesn't work, so he tries another antibiotic. We obviously want to know what these infections are, and sequencing will be the very rapid way, because now you can sequence the bacteria very, very rapidly if you can culture enough of it. And so um, the, the, using this sequencing technology is going to be absolutely critical for pathogen and hospital-acquired infection, and that will have a big impact on the pu public health um, approach. So I've already said this will generate 100,000 genomes is lots of data. Not too far away, every child born in Europe or in the UK will probably be sequenced as and when is necessary. This leads to a large amount of data if, for, if you look at every child born in Europe, this would amount to nine petabases of DNA every week. That's large. Frankly, it's not impossible at all. There's, you know, Google has more data than that by a long way. But nevertheless, it's a huge amount of data to be worrying about. And if we look at our data at EBI, we have many different types of molecular databases. And essentially, all of them are growing rapidly. And so the curve, this is the nucleotide sequences, and it grows um, very, very rapidly indeed. And so if these data are going to be used, then we need to think about how to use them. Now, if, um, actually, I don't know if this, is, if this is going to work. So what I wanted to show you was this is live. So as we are sitting here, this is the use of all the data at the EBI around the world. So as we literally, all of the size of the circle represents how much data is being downloaded. And you can see that it's just used all over the world. Every day we have over 9 million hits on our data resources. This is a phenomenal infrastructure. Now, what I want to say is that if we're going to really use these data in medicine, then we need to find a way and develop a, a parallel infrastructure for medicine and for the, the data that will, will come from many of the molecular assays that are going to be developed. So if we go back to the, to the slide presentation, please. Um, and so... Uh, What we know, if we're going to try and look at that, is that there, is a, there are very big differences between research data and clinical data. Research data, usually it's reference data set, it's a population level, it's open, anyone, anywhere can access, access it. It's all in English language, low legal involvement, transnational. If we look in the clinic, the data belong to an individual patient. They're closed. If we look in Germany, it's all in the German language. So phenotype data is all in German. So this is complicated. There's a very high level of legislation. And obviously, the national governments are involved in this. What we need to do is to find ways to handle these data in a safe and secure way. We need to build bridges to use on the experience, really, the reason that these data that we have at EBI are used so much is that it's just changed, completely revolutionized biological research. Every biological researcher basically now accesses the databases as part of their everyday research. That's not true within the medical profession yet, but it has to be. It's crazy that we don't have online all the most recent knowledge about which variants in which proteins are associated with which diseases. As um, somebody said, it's easier to find out the cheapest pizza uh, around the block than it is to find out you know, which variants might cause a disease. We have not used this technology yet, and we really need to build these bridges. And so the challenges, really, I believe, uh, for delivering genomic medicine are many. But the data issues are certainly one of those challenges. It's the collection, the storage, and maintaining the security, coordinating the exchange of information around the world, because this, the knowledge is international, 
and also providing the infrastructure. Of course, in parallel, and even more important, there are the educate ethical issues, who will give permission to use what data for what, the education, the patients, what they want, and also preparing NH staff for changes to deliver this data-driven evidence-based medicine. I think this is a change in the way that, not, not in the way that researchers think, but in the way that often clinical practice is practiced. So I'll close then just with saying that the infrastructure for data in biological research has really changed the way that we do biological research. My view is that this will change the way that medicine is delivered. And that's the, one of the challenges that we face. And I think this body is right at that interface that can enable some of that to happen. Thank you.